Hello. Uh, microservices have many benefits, enabling fast adoption of new technologies and preventing the sort of code ossification that we all dread in old projects. A key benefit of Scala is type safety. However, microservices create more boundaries between projects, and this can be disruptive when it comes to type safety. Uh, Roland discusses several approaches for dealing with this problem. Uh, Roland's talk title is Distributed Systems v's Compositionality. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity uh, that I can speak uh, to this audience, because I'm, I'm quite interested in feedback uh, that it might inspire. Um, because this, this presentation is not like the ones I've given previously, so it, it's a bit of an experiment. But maybe, um, so you might have heard that I don't work at uh, Lightbend anymore, so just one sentence basically on that. Um, I am CTO and co-founder of Actix. Uh, we are a company, a small startup uh, based in Munich, uh, where um, uh, I'm building a um, an engineering team that is supposed to be local to Europe, so distributed. And what we do is we help small and mid-sized uh, factories um, to assist their personnel, their machine operators and so on, by giving them the right information at the right time and acquiring data and so on, without them having to do many things. So uh, just to make, yeah, to make people, um, uh, to give them the benefits that, of the digital uh, systems that we have started developing, um, over the last uh, 20 years and uh, have everyone a benefit also in this very conservative field uh, of manufacturing. So that was all, all I was going to say about this. Um, then, uh, while listening to the, the previous presentations, um, I, I learned one thing, so it, it, it became clear. And uh, this is why this presentation also is very different, uh, especially from uh, the ones from uh, Raoul and, um, and and Tim before, uh, because uh, I I wondered why why have I never encountered the need to do these monad transformers and and so on, and uh, and I guess you'll you'll see here that um, um, I look at these systems from a, from a bit different perspective. If everything is an actor, um, um, then you have decoupled your your different concerns already in your system and you don't really have to mix different effects to different backends and so on but I'll let, let you judge um, what you what you think after this of this talk um, one caveat uh, I will show some apis that do not yet exist in a form that you can easily consume but that will uh, change rather soon um, in particular, um, with uh, ACA 2.4.11, the new ACA typed implementation will be uh, included. And, well, maybe with a bit of luck, uh, also this session DSL that um, I'll show in, in, the, in the end. Uh, but now to something uh, quite unexpected, I guess. Uh, we choose a very, very weird starting point, uh, namely the Pi Calculus. Who here is fluent in the Pi Calculus? I see uh, two hands, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, um, not unexpected, up there. Uh, so, uh, as a, I should probably introduce uh, right from, from the beginning uh, and leave off the pie. So, uh, what is a calculus, actually? Uh, a calculus, uh, you, can, you could say, uh, is basically two things. First of all, um, it is a syntax for writing down computations or calculations. It's a way to formu uh, formulate them such that uh, they can be understood by other mathematicians, for example, if you write down uh, formulas or um, by computers as well. And then uh, the second part, which is uh, very relevant, is um, how to execute, how to evaluate what you have just described in terms of computation. And these are um, given as reduction rules. Um, and that's these two go together and define a calculus. So uh, let's talk a bit about, I mean, I chose this pi calculus as an example, uh, what this is. Um, this uh, had its roots in the, in the um, Calculus for Communicating Systems, CCS, uh, that Robin Milner developed around 1980. Uh, Tony Hoare um, uh, did around the same time the um, Communicating uh, Sequential Processes, CSP. And uh, the Pi calculus is uh, an improvement over 
CCS in terms of that uh, you can send around channels, communication channels, as parameters, basically. You can send them around as values. So what does it look like? Uh, this is the syntax. Um, we have primitive actions um, denoted by pi, and there are only three of them. Uh, the last one, tau, is an un unobservable internal thing. So whatever your process is, it does something you don't observe on the outside. Uh, this calculus only concerns itself with the communication between processes, so whatever happens inside is invisible. Uh, and the other two actions are coupled. Uh, one is for sending elements uh, along a certain channel, a named channel, and the other is for receiving. Uh, so the uh, x bar is for sending and the x is for receiving, which means for the x bar you need to have, you need to know what y is. And for the x, um, this binds the value that was received to the name y uh, in the subsequent expression. Now, so these are the, the atoms. Uh, then uh, there, is a, uh, there are several rules how you can combine these atoms. Uh, which is given in the second uh, equation. Namely, you can either sum um, over um, the, the, the sequential composition of processes. So you have, take a process P and you prefix it with some atomic action pi. So that's the pi dot P. So you do first pi and then the rest of, of what is in P. Uh, and you can have uh, a sum of those, which means you have um, choices. Uh, you, you, can, you can have different branches, that's what the plus, the, the sum operator does. Then in the second um, um, possibility that you can do, you can run processes P1 and P2 in parallel, uh, independently from each other, um, in, in, in a sense. The third one uh, introduces a new channel name A that you can use within the process P, uh, that is uh, to the right of this operator. Um, the, uh, fourth one is the replication operator, so uh, th that basically expands to P parallel um, exclamation mark P, so it replicates itself indefinitely. And zero or nil is the empty process that doesn't do anything, of course. Uh, that should be uh, quite intuitively named. Uh, is, is that more or less clear? Yeah. Okay, so, so let's, let's um, put on the, the, the most frightening slide of, of the presentation, I promise. Uh, well, uh, perhaps apart from another one that's related to actors, but uh, you'll, you'll decide, you'll decide. So, so this one uh, describes how in the pi calculus uh, we actually perform computations, namely how we reduce terms. Uh, the first one, the first rule is related to these internal actions. Um, if I have a process that has the first thing to be done is a tau action, um, then that just goes away. But what we also see uh, in this reduction rule is that any other choices that this process might have made, so this summation is the overall process, the other choices are discarded. Uh, if, I, if I choose to execute the tau, then only p remains, m is gone. Uh, the same goes for the react rule. The react rule describes how you synchronize two processes by exchanging a message. Uh, we have um, the x bar on the right hand side, so that's where the value named z is um, sent. And on the left hand side we have the x which binds the received value to y. Uh, presumably y is used in the process p in the following, which is why on the right hand side of the arrow, so the reaction goes from, from the left hand side of the arrow to the right hand side, so once we have sent the message, we need to rebind the, the so we need to actually bind the, the value na uh, variable name. So we need to substitute z wherever y was previously in p. And uh, the important thing is that the process q continues uh, in parallel as well. So we have these two processes and they have just exchanged a message uh, from right to left in this case. Then um, parallel execution, that's the par. If we have a reaction that turns P into P prime, uh, then that can occur in parallel to Q. That's what this says. So we have one from P parallel Q to P prime parallel Q. Uh, the res um, describes that uh, the same thing works under um, scoping of the name X, um, which is uh, not very surprising. And the last one um, exploits structural uh, equivalence, which means if 
P is structurally equivalent to Q. There are some rules how, how to make that work. I didn't go to the um, uh, length of describing them here because that might be boring. Um, so if P is equivalent to Q and P prime is equivalent to Q prime, then if I have P to P prime, then I also have Q to Q prime. And with these rules, we can evaluate expressions in the pi calculus. Does that sound exciting so far? Or very boring and you're looking for the beer or... No, uh, let's, let's actually run a computation. That's probably what you need. So um, this is an example. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we are doing it. We're doing the thing, right? Um, so this is an example from Robin Milner's book. I've just um, shamelessly copied it. Uh, so we bind the new name uh, Z, and then we have these three parallel processes here. And now we look at what can happen, what kind of reductions are we allowed to perform. Uh, now there's a possibility number one, that we send this value Y from the left-hand side to the middle, because the middle wants to receive something. And uh, the other possibility is that we send from the right side to the middle because they also, I mean, they communi communicate both on the channel X. So uh, either of these could happen. Uh, so we, we look at possibility one first, uh, what that would mean. So, so that's this one. Um, what we know is if we execute it, then on the left-hand side, we will be left with a nil process. Uh, the other part with the Z and so on will be discarded because that was a choice. On the right hand side, so on, on the middle, we, uh, we will receive the value y and uh, we will substitute y for u in the, in the whole expression. And the right hand side doesn't participate, so it just stays the same. Now, uh, this is what we are left with. Uh, we have two processes that want to send something and none that want to receive anything, so there's nothing we can do. This is the end of the computation. Um, that was a very simple one-step thing. Now, possibility two is a bit more, a uh, bit, bit more interesting, uh, just to get you into the spirit of executing this. Right? This is, this is exciting. So, possibility number two: we send the channel Z from the right to the middle, which means that the right proce right-hand process uh, will be finished, but the middle one will then have U rewritten as Z, like this. Now we actually send along the channel Z the value V, and there it just happens to be a process on the left-hand side that is ready to receive on the channel Z. So we can do uh, exactly this one possibility here, and what we are left with will be um, that we substitute V for, for, for the W, and that is the result. Now, of course, we can leave out nil processes and Z doesn't feature, so, so that would be the result of the computation. Is that clear so far? So, yeah, question? Okay, cool. So we have seen we can, we can run these processes. That was the purpose of this exercise. But there's more. Um, we can check whether, uh, whether the processes are equivalent um, by structural congruence. I said equivalence before. It, it's, it, it's termed structural congruence. Sorry for the mishap. Um, which means you can do certain things, like you can uh, rename channels if you do it consistently, of course. Uh, you can reorder in sums, because in choices it doesn't really matter in which way you, you write them down. Uh, you can expand recursion, and there are, there are some rules that you can apply that in order to transform these, these equations. It's just like normal mathematical equation um, uh, manipulations. Uh, that's one tool. And there is another tool which is called um, bi-simulation. So if you have one process that exhibits a certain behavior and you have another process that when, it, when you put it in this, uh, in a, you put both in a context where they offer and, and offer to send or receive along the same channels and so on. And the result of the computations is the same. Then they are by simulation. So one is a simulation of the other. They, there, there is no observable difference between the two. So you always can substitute one for the other. You, so there is a notion of you can you can speak about program or process equivalence. Of course, this is not universal, uh, universally decidable, but you can do certain things. So uh, to wrap this up, uh, answering the in, uh, initial question in in a slightly different fashion. What is a calculus? Uh, a calculus is a way to write down computations. 
and it also includes means um, and tools and so on to reason about computations. But what this is all really about is to compose things, to compose computations and calculations um, so that you can start small and have building blocks and build them up and then you can still reason about the result. Uh, that is basically what a calculus is all about. Which brings us a bit closer um, to the title of the presentation, which is, it's really about composition. So what means of composition do we have in the Pi calculus? Uh, we have seen that we can run things in parallel. Uh, we can run things sequentially, sorry, with a dot. So where you can say first that, then that, then that, and so on. And this order cannot be broken, right? Uh, you need to always treat the thing that's leftmost first. That's sequential composition. Then with this vertical bar, we have um, uh, parallel, uh, compute parallel composition. And with the message send, we have the ability to synchronize different processes that run together. Um, so we have quite powerful means at our disposal. So how does it look like? Um, we have two processes and we want them to do something together. Let's say uh, we have a client and we have a service and the client shall use the service. Then, of course, we need to uh, describe how that should happen, how that interaction should, should start. Um, we have a channel, CA, the name we, 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 we define here. Uh, and then uh, we have some expected behavior that we want, namely that the process P client will send along this channel CA and it will ev actually, uh, e um, eventually react to the response. If it doesn't react to the response, then the service won't be able to deliver it because it's, it's a synchronization point. Uh, on the other hand, the, the, the service also is expected to do things. First of all, it's expected to first react to CA and eventually send back a response. Sending back a response would need to occur on a separate channel that is the thing that is being sent, presumably, from the client to the service uh, 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 at first. Okay, so can we just take any P client and any P service and plug them together and expect them to work? Not really. Now, there are clear expectations here. The, P, the, the client needs to do a certain set of things, a sequence of things, and the service needs to do a sequence of things. And if either of them does not do what they're supposed to, the whole process won't work. So we need something more. I mean, the Pi calculus is nice and so on, but it doesn't make sure that this program actually does what it's supposed to do. We need something that describes the communication discipline between the client and the service, which means we need protocols. Protocols are what describe um, exactly this, uh, how two or more parties interact. Um, so it def a protocol defines a communication discipline, who can send which message at which point in time, and conversely, who should expect to receive which message uh, and when, and so on. And only if all the distributed processes that you're considering adhere to these protocols uh, will your program actually work. Uh, because if they don't, uh, then expectations will be violated and things will stop working. So uh, this is a pretty tough one. Uh, and everybody knows, uh, everybody who, is, who has worked with any sort of uh, networked um, protocol or product or, or, or so, um, I guess that's everyone here. Um, knows that if, if you screw this up, then it, it just won't work. This means that we need to be a bit careful with our protocols. Uh, but luckily, there are some pro uh, cases or many cases where we can describe a protocol that involves all the parties and we can check this protocol for coherency, basically. We can check it for whether it terminates uh, in, in a finite time. Uh, we can check whether any party um, in the exchange can be confused at any point in time and so on. So we can check the protocol for safety. Uh, this is normally done um, with, a, uh, with another tool um, that is related to what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, I, I realize I forgot a slide here. So the, call, uh, the, the, the tool that is used to check these um, is called Scribble. Um, but You'll see that if you look at that uh, uh, site, which uh, I put the link up here, uh, which is primarily about session types. Uh, session types describe communications. Uh, and they are the tools that we, that we are looking into uh, in order to formalize uh, what all this means and, and so on. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in the very end. 
Um, now it suffices uh, that a session type uh, uh, describes the structure of a communication, a sequence of interactions between processes uh, in, in a programming model that entirely focuses on communication only. So whatever the, the, the parties do um, internally to, in order to decide which value to send, for example, is completely irrelevant. We can use the, the, the lovely tools from functional programming, for example, to com compose a, a response, right? Um, but uh, when it comes to making sure that all the exchange works, uh, well, we need these protocols. Uh, we, uh, ori originally, there were only binary uh, session protocols, which means two participants, but since 2008, um, we have multi-party session types, which can describe many uh, participants. Um, the, the, the primitives uh, we have in these, in these sessions, how we describe them, are sending, receiving, sequence, choice, and recursion, which are basically all the same things that the Pi calculus has, uh, which is why I took that as an example to start out from. Now, um, before, yeah, before we go into, into those troublesome areas, um, I'd like to just show you one. Uh, this is an extremely simple protocol. Uh, request response. It's what I talked about previously. Um, one process sends a request to the other and then expects a response back. Um, so this session request response um, co corresponds to sending the request with uh, some parameters and then afterwards, so the dot here is also sequencing, uh, we expect to receive a response with the result. This is the client. The server needs to implement the dual protocol, so the dual to the session type, which is uh, called S request uh, response overline. So this, uh, this um, inverts all the actions, basically. There are, are clear rules. I, I didn't show choices in here and so on to keep it simple, but there are rules how to compute the, uh, basically the inverse of, of uh, a session. So the server first receives the request and then sends the response. This is all common sense. Now. How useful is this really? I mean, we have multi-party session types, but um, would we really want to write down like a full global protocol of all the services within eBay? Um, I don't know. Uh, eBay has lots of microservices. I don't know how, uh, how many exactly, probably like 10,000. Would that really scale to this kind of magnitude? It would probably not. So what we would normally do is uh, we model the, the interactions that occur between different parts of the system with smaller protocols. That's, what's com that's what composition is all about. Yeah? We have small pieces, small building blocks. So what happens? Um, let's assume we do lots of just request response to keep things very simple. So the client asks the service, service A. Service A needs the help of some backend A, makes also a request. Uh, backend A somehow needs to ask another service, I don't know, user authentication thingy, whatever, uh, which also has a backend. But now, if this backend somehow were to, in, in the course of, of uh, trying to compute the response, were to ask something of service A, things would fall flat on their face. Um, because uh, service A is expecting a response at that time, it is not expecting a request. Yeah. So service A would have to be specifically coded in order to allow these things and so on. Um, but the problem is session types wouldn't have told us about this problem because we have just put things together and composed them uh, in a way that is unsafe. We have just broken the promise, uh, which means, um, well, my conclusion at least so far is protocols don't compose. Uh, I asked uh, the researchers from this um, um, ABCD group um, last year, and that was then still a uh, state of the art, that in general, protocols do not compose. Uh, if you have two session types, for example, and you plug them together, you cannot guarantee anything about the safety properties of, of the result. Uh, that's the problem. There are some cases that are okay, um, but there are, uh, I mean, there are known, known things like, like cycles um, that are not okay, because it's easy to demonstrate how it's not okay. It might be okay if, if these protocols are not really interacting, so if not, not one is blocking the other, but we don't really know how to compose them. That's really sad. It's really sad. But, um, I mean, we still have time, so, so we can solve another problem instead. Uh, let, let's do that. 
so uh, that, that was one of the, the important points. Yeah? We cannot have uh, the really nice uh, compositional distributed systems, but at least uh, we can try um, to compose the behavior that the, the actors or the agents, the participants of the communication have. Um, we can make that nice. Uh, for example, we can use PyCalculus. PyCalculus is awesome because if I have an, um, some, some actor that is on one side a service A and is on the other, other side a client B, so I have a web frontend, for example, gets a request which needs to talk to some backend as well. So it needs to do both of these things. In PyCalculus, it's trivial. We just write them next to, other, uh, next to one another and put this pipe in between and, and it's all, all nice. Well, of course, there will be some sort of uh, internal channels that we need in order to synchronize uh, how things get from the left to the right-hand side. Uh, but that's so awesome. Uh, now comes the other scary slide. And uh, you might decide whether that's more scary than the other. And it doesn't even show an attempt to do this. Um, this is um, typical actor code in the normal Akka actor untyped module uh, that deals with an actor that goes through different states. It's a state machine, starts with initial initializing, then uses context become to switch to the next state and uh, creates an actor and switches to waiting for results and then when it's done, switches back and so on. Um, this describes uh, how the actor behaves but there is a very clear syntactic bottleneck here, or a semantic bottleneck. Context.become modifies the current behavior of the actor, and there is only exactly one of those. So if you write down uh, an actor that, uh, so if you try to factor this out as this is the left-hand side of this vertical bar, and you want to compose it with another right-hand side, it wouldn't work, because they would both use context.become, and one would overwrite the other, and things just wouldn't work. So um, with actors, I'm sad to say that they don't even compose on the inside, at least not in that code base. Um, so, but uh, there's something we can do about that. Uh, we just need reusable, composable behavior snippets. Smells a bit like monads to me, um, but we, we'll get there. Uh, so, the very radical idea um, came to me while listening to Alex's presentation at uh, Scala Days this year. Um, the idea is basically to use PyCalculus, but not between actors, because I still think that that's not the right way to do it because of the synchronous rendezvous exchange that just wouldn't work in a distributed system. No, to use PyCalculus within the actors. We create a DSL, which allows us to formulate these independent processes that we can then compose sequentially and in parallel and so on, um, so that they together make up what one actor is. Does that sound like a, like a good thing to try? Yeah? So, one thing we need to do is we need to lift um, the operations that can be done. Because we want to abstract, or uh, no, we don't want to abstract, we want to sequence actions that the actor can take, like sending and receiving messages and so on. So it's some sort of lifted representation. That's where the, where the monad comes in. So what does it look like? Now we're actually going to talk about ACA code for a little bit. Um, on the left-hand side, I have put the um, primitives from the pi calculus and what they map to in this new experimental um, very researchy branch of archetyped. So there is a channel abstraction that creates a channel. Yeah? Well, server channel equals channel. The, the 128 is the, the buffer size. It's, it's how many elements can be put in without ever reading, because it's still an asynchronous channel. Then um, P, so the, the, the abstraction uh, aspect that you can build up processes is captured by having this type called process. A process yields a value when it has been uh, executed, and you can compose these processes. Uh, a process can be can be com compound, uh, can can execute as many actions as you need to compute this value. In this case, an actor if um, the composition happens uh, sequentially by using four comprehensions. So here, first we run the initialized process, uh, which results in a backend reference. Then we run the register process, which uses this to create the server channel. 
and then we finally yield uh, the run process. Uh, I'll show that later. Uh, so this means we can sequentially uh, compose these steps. Then we can also compose in parallel by saying fork. Fork takes another process and results in a process of unit. When this is evaluated, um, the current process keeps running. The value that has been produced is unit, but uh, as, a, as an effect, the, the, the task that has been given has been spawned as a parallel task and will continue on its own. Uh, there are some, some sugar um, um, methods uh, for combining tasks. So if you fork, they are independent. Uh, but if you say race, then uh, you can tie them together and say whichever completes first gets to decide the value that I get, uh, which is very useful for formulating timeouts. So you can, can have a read on the service channel which races against a timeout of one second. Or um, you can use join, where you get the results of both sides in a tuple two. Then, uh, the last two, sending and receiving. So, uh, receiving has been implemented already. Uh, that's the read action, because it's asynchronous. Um, so far, I have not implemented an, a uh, synchronous send action, which would need to be a process. Uh, right now, it all goes via actor ifs, but um, that can, I think, easily be fixed. Um, that's one good thing about this conference-driven development. Uh, I just realized that it's, it, it lines up so nicely while doing this slide. Anyway, um, so I was uh, going to show you this server process because you should also see this a bit in action. I mean, this is, this is runnable code. This, this compiles and, and runs uh, if you use the right branch. There's a pull request open on GitHub. Uh, so this gets a channel and an actor ref and produces a process of nothing because this process never terminates. It's a server, after all. So what we do here is we use for comprehension um, to um, write down nicely what, what is supposed to happen. I mean, we could have written flat map as well. Um, so we read from the server channel, which yields uh, the command. Then we match the command if it's uh, a get it uh, message. Then uh, we create a process. Don't run it yet. We create a process uh, from by, by using this method talk with backend, and that is the compose uh, the reusability and composability I'm talking about. We can factor out the talking with the backend. I'll show that in, on the next slide, um, in a completely different method which yields a process, and this process uh, then is composed with for each um, to execute the effect of sending. Um, the reply, the, the got it to the reply to channel. And then what we actually return is we fork the spin off with a timeout of five seconds, and then we continue running the server process immediately. So the uh, server keeps spinning, 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 spinning off these talk with backend tasks, uh, which clean themselves up after five seconds. Uh, talk with backend, just for completeness sake, uh, creates two of these channels, single use. They expect only one message ever. And uh, so the backend gets asked, uh, basically, get thing code. And once, so we read and seal the code. Uh, the code.ref is used uh, as the reply to in the message, right? Which means we can read the reply in the for comprehension. And then we yield a value that's derived from it. It's just um, made up um, usage. Uh, the astute reader will have noticed um, that I don't quite like uh, for comprehensions, namely the aspect that the last step is always a map. Because you see, there's a process um, yielded here. Um, for this DSL, I have chosen to implement map directly in terms of flat map. So map is the same as flat map. Because if you don't do that, you always, uh, in the server process, it would be a problem. Uh, you always have one additional map identity that you acc accrue for every uh, iteration that you do. There is one more, and you'll never execute them, which means the server will run out of memory eventually. So that is a bit of, bit of the awkward part of the API, so to speak. Yeah, so um, you've seen actor refs, but not much else of ACA here, right? So what does this have to do with ACA? There is an ACA typed behavior which implements an interpreter for this DSL, for this language, uh, for this process language. Uh, the channel reference has been implemented in ACA typed as a very lean, uh, small um, child actor ref. 
uh, and there is an interesting duality going on here. Uh, the actor model differs from um, CCS and CSP uh, in two key aspects. Actors have this um, actors have an identity and they have this one channel that they receive on, basically. While uh, in the in the process calculi, um, processes have many channels, but a process itself has no identity whatsoever. Uh, and I think um, this this might be interesting because um, this DSL basically bridges the gap between the actor that has still this main entry uh, control channel as as I've used it so far, um, and the ability to add other channels that you can receive on uh, that are independent from the main channel. So, yeah, I, I'm I'm interested to hear hear your feedback on on how, how that feels like. Anyway, that is mostly what I was going to talk about. Um, there's just one one piece of outlook, um, because I'm very very hopeful that this will lead to actually being able to write systems that are distributed where we can reason about their correctness far more than we can today. And that is by tracking effects. If we track effects of the processes, like sending and receiving, once I have actually added the sending, um, using a tool, perhaps something like graded monads or whatever, um, then we can use uh, the knowledge that there is an embedding of session types into the pi calculus, because what, what, what is modeled here is the pi calculus and not se session types directly. Uh, so we should be able to use the session type machinery um, to create something that allows us to verify that the process does the right thing. Yeah? Basically, the, the, the hope is that we can uh, write something that turns a scribble description of a global protocol into a Scala type that you need to implement um, as a process. And if you do it, then it will be correct. And if you don't, the compiler will tell you you're doing the wrong thing. Now, um, th now this comes, it comes another slide uh, that might be scary. Um, it's just asking for feedback. So this is not real, right? This does not compile. This does not exist. It's completely irresponsible. But um, what I'm trying to do here is um, to track effects. And if someone has a better idea than this one, I'm, I'm very keen to hear it. So this is, this is somewhat like a graded monad. Um, effects would be uh, like a heterogeneous tree of, of types. It's a type level tree that models not only sequencing of effects, but also effects that can, uh, so um, for, the, for the map, you have this colon star colon for sequencing, but also for a join and fork, uh, you would have to have different kind of composition that can, that can uh, be recorded in the types such that you know, okay, I have these two processes, then uh, that, that's the choice operator in the session types uh, sense, where I can either have these effects or those effects. And then the program should still be compared correctly to the session type. And another one, another aspect is the read operation would uh, return an effect that, that is parameterized by the singleton type of the channel that it operates on. I'm not at all sure that that's the be best way to model this. But if someone has ideas, I'm, I'm very keen to hear them. So uh, that's, uh, that's future. That's where I hope to get to at some point. Now, uh, current state. Uh, the behavior composition works, uh, the imp interpreter works, you can run the program uh, and it works and it does what it's supposed to do. Effects are not yet tracked, uh, the Scribble plugin of course does not yet exist, uh, but there is theoretical work being done by the ABCD group and in uh, particular in London by uh, Nobuko and Alcieste. Uh, I should probably mention that um, I'm driving this not only as a hobby project because at Actix we are we want to use Akatyped really for, for our production code to make sure that our actors compose in the right way. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions? It kind of, um, yeah, well, of course, uh, it's still event driven. So the actor will only um, act on external stimulus that it gets. And whenever it gets something, it will run on one thread all the effects that this stimulus has. So it's still effectively single th uh, threaded as far as that is concerned. 
but it's concurrent, uh, concurrent in the Node.js sins. <laughs> it's, it's useful, uh, right? It's, it, it helps. More questions? That is a good question, and uh, one that I asked myself uh, in the 45 minutes before this presentation as well, uh, after having seen these other presentations like yours um, about uh, free and, and all the tools that are available. So I have not yet thought about that. Uh, so far, it's a manually implemented monad and interpreter. Yeah? Yes, and there is another, um, another kind of bug I realized in this example, namely that the recursion that is provided by the calcul uh, PyCalculus, this um, exclamation mark operator, would solve this problem right away. So this would not really be a problem. I, I picked the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong one to try and demonstrate. Because it would, well, it would be po possible to formulate processes where this would be a problem but the naive solution wouldn't have it. But still, uh, the point is that um, uh, while it's possible to write P service A in a way that this works, um, it would be really nice if the compiler or whatever would tell us that we need to do so. That's, that's the thing. We can still write it incorrectly. We can, we can write it such that it is a problem. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing. I, I don't think that is in general doable, especially at the scale of 10,000 microservices. Um, nobody will be able to run the analysis whether these are all wired together correctly. So we'll, we'll have to restrict. I mean, the, 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 this is, mm, this is uh, extreme power, right? Everybody can do everything. But uh, we can restrict the messaging patterns between the different microservices, for example, in that specific case. To, to the safe ones, so the non-cyclic graphs or whatever have you, uh, that is necessary. That might be less expressive than it could be, but it could be the safe subset. Who knows? Yeah? When you do finish this thing, are you going to make it open source for all of us to use? This is all on GitHub. It's in the ACA repository, and uh, yeah, it's all open source. I'm talking about like the last piece, so you were defining the new model and the new... Yeah, yeah. That's, oh, that is also in the ACA repository. It's all open source. So um, I, I don't want to keep you from, from the beer any longer, uh, I think. So, so thanks for your attention. Thank you.